Hello, I'm John Chivaco, the co-chair of the NIGEO 2023 conference and a board member of the New York Geothermal Energy Organization. I'd like to welcome you to this recording of a live presentation from the conference, a two-day event which was held in Albany, New York on April 26th and 27th of 2023. This year's educational sessions and keynotes represent the latest in ground source heat pump system design, product innovations, and installation practices, along with important policy, regulatory, financing, and incentive updates. This presentation is one of over 40 sessions from the two-day event, all of which were recorded and available at NIGEO's website, www.ny-geo.org, along with session descriptions and a link to download the slides from each of the sessions presented. NIGEO is proud to make this content available to our members and other industry stakeholders. And if you are a member, thanks so much for your support and participation. If you find this content valuable and for some odd reason, you are not yet a member, consider joining NIGEO at the appropriate membership level with details available at our website. The live recording from the NIGEO 2023 conference will start in just a moment. Thanks so much for listening. All right, I, th I think we're going to get going. <clears throat> uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Andrew Piper, and I am part of the clean heating and cooling team at NYSERDA. Um, so very excited here to talk about innovative uh, borehole solutions. This is something that the entire clean heating and cooling team um, discusses on a pretty regular basis, because without innovation of technology, um, you know, we're not going to be able to grow the market. So um, I'd like to have the panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll get right into the slides. Thanks. Uh, my name is Dave Hermanton. I work for Brightcore Energy. I'm an engineer, um, and I'm happy to be here. Robert Jensen from Agreenability, uh, the manufacturer of the Twister heat exchanger, and uh, I'm an engineer, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> uh, Bill Busher with Total Green Manufacturing. We manufacture the direct exchange uh, closed loop geothermal systems. Well, bonjour. My name is Jean-Francois Lavoie from Versa Profiles. So um, if you want to keep you awake, I can do the presentation in French. Would that help anything? So very glad to be here. Looking forward for the discussion. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, we'll jump right in. Dave, you're going to be first up. Great. Uh, I'm here to make everyone else seem a little bit smoother and cooler with what they're presenting. I'm actually filling in for the owner of Rigan Corporation. Um, Rigan is a, a high performance ground heat exchanger that's been around for about, I think about 15 years. So like about, you're gonna hear a lot of that because I'm, I'm guessing at some of this. Um, Lane Lawless is the, um, the owner of Rigan, CEO and owner of Rigan. He couldn't make it here today because he has business overseas uh, in the UK. So, um, I've gotten to know um, the manufacturer of this particular heat exchanger because I specified it on a number of jobs. And um, it came about because I uh, was working as a consultant and um, had people reach out to me because they had some failing open loop geothermal systems. And specifically, they were um, standing column well systems. Standing column well systems is a type of open loop system that uses a very deep well and has a couple of components in it. There is um, there's a shroud, that's like a big long PVC pipe that goes down to the bottom of the well. That's perforated. And then you put a submersible well pump inside of that shroud. And then you have a pair of pipes that go to and from the building. So you have you know, your heat exchange happening in this well against the borehole wall. Water gets pumped in the mechanical system and back. Uh, conceptually, great. In reality, not so great usually, or at least in my experience. And they're, they're kind of prone to issues with fouling uh, due to precipitation of minerals that are in the water, whether it's iron causing iron bacteria growth or just hardness. There are um, issues with groundwater quantity, 
whether you're using these systems in a way that you're rejecting water. So I'm not, I want to go on a, a rant of uh, what's wrong with standing column wells. I think I just did. But this technology was utilized to be able to, um, to, to utilize the boreholes that were drilled to install standing column well system. We have people call this, uh, this technology as a rescue fit for standing column wells because it's a concentric heat exchanger they can be installed very deep. So my experience is with, um, I guess, uh, Rygan, I'm going to cover on a couple of slides later on in this deck. So this is a cross-section, like a, a, a cutaway of a Rygan high-performance heat exchanger. It's a coaxial, which uh, means that there is, I guess, two axes to it. You, you have um, the conductor pipe, I guess, or the pipe that's supplying water shown on the um, on your right with the red arrow that's going in. One thing that's wrong about this picture is these things are completely filled with the circulating fluid that's going to and from the building. There is no air space at the top there. Shame on those guys for not fixing that. So you have the red arrow that's going down through the coaxial, uh, through the, the feeder pipe that goes all the way to the bottom of the well. And like I said, these can be very deep. Uh, they've been installed up to 1,500 feet deep. Then the bottom, water flows up and exchanges heat on the exterior portion, uh, the exterior of this um, of the coaxial uh, heat exchanger. And then uh, you see the blue arrow goes back to the building because, you know, it's rejecting heat in summertime. So with geothermal, I guess generally, you know, you, you need to... I'm kind of stalling myself. Be careful how I say this. You know, you have a limited number of tools for your toolbox. A lot of us engineers uh, are kind of like stifled with, oh, well, you know, like if I have U-bends, I can only fit them at 20-foot spacing and I can only go to 500 feet deep or 600 feet deep and uh, there's not enough capacity in the ground uh, that I can, that I'm able to get with a conventional ground heat exchanger. That isn't always true. Here's a big project that was completed relatively recently in Boston. It's a new data science building. My colleague Tracy Ogden uh, was um, the, the consultant um, that managed this project for the GC. Big building, not that many boreholes, 31 boreholes to 1,500 feet deep. Some pictures of uh, what's going on, uh, you know, heavy construction. Not a lot of room for a lot of boreholes, so they were able to get a lot of capacity and minimizing the number of boreholes that were installed here. And you can see, you know, that this is in, in action. What you see at the bottom there is the wellhead of one of these Rigan heat exchangers. And you can see the reverse return circuit piping that's, that's going, uh, I guess, you know, from the bottom up in the screen and back. That looks like a sump a pump, a little trash pump there in the corner, in de doing some dewatering. Um, I'm not sure what that, I guess that wire is the plug. This is a very technical presentation that I'm giving here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a river. Uh, so <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah, so that's the building. All right, the, the Trinity Church uh, was a building in Boston. I think they had about six uh, standing column wells that needed to be fixed. Uh, so uh, similar application to the one that I mentioned before I was involved in. So uh, a, a, a fixed project where they uh, took all the innards out of a standing column well and deployed this, um, uh, the, the high performance ground heat exchanger uh, to 1500 feet. So some, some of the installation shots. So. With every technological option, there's good and bad, and there, there's you know pros and cons. Now, so the pros, you know, I mentioned is that you can fix like failed open wells with this system. I'll get into like how they perform well because the material they're made out of and how this how this this system models out from like a, an engineering um, geothermal modeling perspective. But you can see these guys installing this. It, this material comes in sticks, either 20 feet or 40 feet long. You need to have um, a, a little, um, um, what do we call it, a little bucket, like a little uh, scissor lift type of uh, to configuration to be able to 
set these things from the top and position them to the bottom where this guy is uh, connecting them with like a pipe wrench. It uses an epoxy material. These are uh, flush thread, so there's like, you know, thread uh, without a coupling. So you put some epoxy on it and you spin them together and and you can deploy the epoxy right into the water. Um, it, it, it's like super fast acting epoxy. And I, I'm making that up. Um, but, you know, it really works. Um, this is one of the first projects I think that they did, the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Museum in Chicago. You can see that uh, they have like this uh, little, they're doing with a boom truck there, lifting up the sticks and then deploying them down there, you know, putting the epoxy on and then they're deploying them down. Um, this, this is a project that actually that, um, uh, the, the engineer that um, designed and installed this fixed project was someone that I, I spoke to initially to do my due diligence to find out about this technology. Longfellow House, Cambridge Mass, bunch of standing column wells. They um, fixed them with uh, the high performance heat exchanger and I think they may have even added a couple additional wells for additional capacity there. So this technology can be used for you know, this type of fix and also in new boreholes that are drilled. Um, another example of where this is used. A long time ago. Um, I, I don't know. Um, so yeah, you know, um, they're having some success with this product overseas. Lane couldn't make it today because he's over in the UK. Um, actually, um, I, I think they're selling quite a bit of this there. So this is one of my projects. So um, I, I needed a solution for this building owner or this municipality that owned the library um, and found out about the product. I got a bunch of references, called a bunch of people that answered a lot of questions that I had from how to design these systems, how to model them, how to design them on paper, put details together for them, how to construct them, how to do oversight with the drillers, and, and then how to, I guess, start these systems up, how to bleed them out of air, how, how to get them started um, during startup and commissioning. So, you know, the resources were available to me, and that's super valuable, you know, being the guy who you know, pulls the trigger on using an innovative technology. Uh, I was also able to, to monitor the, the systems for a couple of years. So, like, whenever it got really cold at first or really hot, I would go, you know, and log into the BMS system and just satisfy myself that the modeling I did made sense. You know, these systems aren't HDPE pipes, so conventional modeling software like Glee Pro and GLD aren't really set up for this. Glee Pro can be used to model this. Um, you have to put in the right parameters for the thickness of the, the heat exchanger and uh, the right thermal properties of the material. Um, but yeah, you know the, what you get is a very low thermal uh, borehole thermal resistance. You know when you when you assemble this model, and I was able to watch it for a couple of years, and it actually performs as as advertised. So that's my experience with the Rigan. That's Connecticut Well. They did the, the job. Connecticut Well. Great drillers. Uh, beautiful piping that those guys did. And that's it. <laughs> All right. So that's, well, that's New York Geo. That's not me. I'm here to talk about the Twister. Um, and uh, so. I guess I had a slightly different approach to things. I, Greenability was founded in 2010 because at, at the time I had been working with some pipe manufacturers and people in the industry telling me there's gotta be a better way, I guess kind of like the title of this program here today, but you have a six inch borehole generally speaking and we're putting two pipes into it generally speaking. I know there's variations to this, but that was a very inefficient way of exchanging heat with the ground. So the thought process was how do you do something better and I had a number of different iterations to come up with uh, a better way to exchange heat in the ground. Ultimately I was trying to find a way to have a product that was easy to install that took full use of the borehole space and that uh, was relatively cheap so that it would be ec make economical sense to use it for most of the applications that we see out there. And it, it was kind of hard to figure out. Some of the earlier product, products that I had come up with were um, 
like a, a circular pipe with a wall down the middle. They would have had to have been delivered in 20 or 40 foot sections to be put together. And doing all of that work out in the field just costs a lot of money. It slows down the process. And I just figured that this is not the right way to go about it. And ultimately, I settled on this idea of the twister. And, um, and you're going to get a uh, first look at what it happens when you get AI to help you write something down. And so <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to uh, be eloquent in how to say this. But uh, the twister is a type of ground source heat exchanger that utilizes a unique spiral design with four individual loops of pipe the design increases the amount of heat transfer between a ground and a heat exchanger, which improves the efficiency and lowers installation cost. The twister system is designed to be compact, easy to install, making it an attractive option for both residential and commercial applications. That's AI for you right there. So I thought that was pretty good. That was better than anything I've come up with. So um, there's, a, there's a, a look at the picture, the cross section of it, and I'll get into it a little bit. But here I'm showing you that on a standard bore you had two pipes, right? It could be towards the middle, it could be towards the outside. In general, it winds up somewhere in the middle, kind of like that. But you got to make room for the tremi line too, so that pushes the product over to one side. And when you figure out the performance values of this product, we have something called the borehole thermal resistance values. Many of you know it, some of you don't. But you can see down in that lower corner there that there are some values. You can see the units there. The, the, all I want you to notice is that the twisters are the lower ones, right, in the green there. And they are at pretty much as low as you can get them. Um, and that means that, they, that this, the pipe will perform. It will exchange heat better than pretty much anything that you can come up with. Um, so let me go back to here. So you know, it reduces. The borehole thermal resistance by up to 80% compared to some of the standard technologies that we use today. And um, we do that by this physical arrangement that we have of this product, uh, of the pipe around in a borehole. Um, so what it is, is four individual U-bend loops of three-quarter inch pipe arranged around this center tremi pipe. Or it's not a tremi pipe, but it's a conduit for the tremi line. And what that does is it allows us to insert the tremi down the middle of the borehole instead of towards the outside. Had we put it on the outside, we would have, this product is four and a half inches in diameter. Had we put it on the outside, you'd need something bigger than a, than a six inch borehole to put this in. But by putting the tremi line down the middle, we can optimize the use of this borehole space and get maximum performance. The other thing that it does, and I may have another slide about this a little bit later on, but then I'll just skip it. Uh, is that it is an unobstructed uh, path for the tremi line to get to the bottom of the bore, right? So you can insert, uh, you know, five boreholes of the twister and come back and grout them all at the same time. You don't have to worry about collapsing boreholes or anything because there's an open path for that tremi line to come back down. And that enhances further the installation process and uh, allows you to, to play with efficiencies and, and get more efficient and, and lower cost of installation. It's delivered on coils. You saw that first picture, a giant coil, right? So there's no assembly process out in the field. There's no um, need for you to assemble you know, 20 or 40 foot sections, fuse them together in some cases. None of that happens. <clears throat> so it's installed just like the standard loop is today, which everybody seems to love, just a standard process, right? There's not a lot to do, not a lot to learn, not a lot to learn here. Um, so let's see. So the benefits of doing this, typically, 20 to 50 percent less drilling. Like I, I used a general number Resi with residential projects, it's about a third less. So if we have a three borehole project, we do it with two, right? And that saves as much as like 25 percent on the cost of a uh, residential system. And uh, commercially, it can be even more. Sometimes the cost for drilling with uh, prevailing wages and all this stuff, there's a lot of additional costs on commercial projects. So. Uh, you know, an average of 20% reduction in loop field costs saves time, saves space, less complicated, and avoid, you can avoid difficult dr drilling sometimes if you have, uh, you know, uh, I was just doing a borehole up in upstate New York that was producing more than 200 gallons a minute at, uh, you know, 450 feet. So if you stay above that, you avoid a lot of uh, cost with uh, 
uh, water containment, and so on. Um, so I think we've gone past most of those things there. So, uh, this was meant to be a video, but I can see it's not going to show up as a video here. But this is a 500-foot loop of twister being installed on the campus of Princeton University. It went in in four minutes for 500 feet. And the idea here is to explain that the installation process is really quite simple. You look at this product and you might think that it's big and cumbersome and it's not going to want to go down a bore, but that just isn't uh, what is being experienced out in the field. Um, and this is a picture of a cross-section of a grouted product. I wanted to show this because I did say earlier that it has this superior grouting process, but I didn't explain that that center conduit is corrugated, but it's also perforated so that when you stuck, stick the tremie in all the way to the bottom and you start pumping, the grout comes out. And New Jersey is a state that is very strict on their grouting processes because they're concerned about aquifer contamination. So they wanted to be 100% certain that we were not going to have any cross-contamination of, of aquifers. And they made me do this test where we grouted the product in a, you know, a PVC pipe that was, I think, 40 feet tall that we piled up and then grouted it, and then we cut it into sections. And what you can see here, what I really want to point out is that every little bit of this pipe is thoroughly grouted. And this is a cementaceous mix, which is very, very thick. So that would be like the worst case scenario. And this also, by the way, enhances performance um, in the sense that if you get incomplete grouting, and something that I see out in the field, and I don't want to name any names, but Sometimes that tremor line just doesn't want to go to the bottom. And what, what is your only choice at that point is you just, well, you start pumping and hope that the density of the grout will carry it to the bottom. That's what you hope for. But that just isn't what happens. What happens is the grout mixes with the water and it reduces the conductivity and you don't get performance. So again, you have a, ca a path to the bottom. We will guarantee that you're going you're gonna to grout it properly and you're going to get the performance that you want from the grout. Um, some th the features that we have added over the last few years is in the past we used to have all the pipes coming out of the ground. There was a pain in the ass, excuse me, to uh, connect. But now we have a, a manifold so that all that sticks out of the ground are inch and a quarter pipes. So to connect it um, in the field is the same as, as inch and a quarter lines. You just connect it to the inch and a quarter. You heat fuse it. Just as simple as, as what we do today typically. Um, so then I just wanted to talk about the economics a little bit. You know, drilling costs have been on the rise, you know, often $20, $25 a foot. Grout is expensive, 3 to $4 a gallon. Pipe, $2 per foot of bore, you know, so a dollar per foot of, of inch and a quarter pipe or inch and a half or whatever we're using. Trenching is even expensive, 15 to $20 a foot. And casing, forget about it, right? I mean, casing has gotten so expensive. So, you know, I, I took a, a school project that we uh, were involved with designing and 210 bores, 400 feet deep of inch and a quarter, with 140 bores of twister instead, and analyzed the um, the cost implications of doing that. And what it worked out to be is the things that I want to stress here is that the twister product can be qu you know quite expensive by comparison, you know almost three times as much. But because of the amount of drilling that we reduced it by, and because of the fact that there's only half the amount of grout used in a project altogether, <laughs> the cost of the materials for both of these projects is the same, roughly, 510 and 533,000, right? Not a big difference. So we talked about the cost of drilling before. That's where the savings come from. So not only are you saving space and then, you know less drilling, but the cost of that drilling is where's the final number, $583,000 less on this project. 25% uh, reduction in cost. That's the economics of it. Then there are some additional savings by, you know, the amount of trenching and casing that comes along, and that could be highly variable from project to project. You can't guarantee any of those things, but it's a factor that we also help improve. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you all for being here. Uh, 
Today we're going to talk about just the advantages of a direct exchange uh, uh, geothermal closed loop. So this is a little different than the traditional um, closed loop that, that's using water and, and uh, 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 like a polyethylene pipe. Uh, and at the end of the day, every geothermal system comes down to the performance and the savings. And that's really what this is about is if we can uh, design and install a more effective heat exchanger, ground heat exchanger, we're going to see that in the results, in the savings and the energy uses. And that's really what this comes down to. So using a direct exchange uh, loop design, we're going to be able to, first of all, from a design standpoint, um, it's, all fa it's a factory built, factory design. So there's a lot of stress of making sure that this is the proper design, that we're going to get the proper efficiencies and the return that we're expecting, that the client's expecting, is kind of taken out of the equation with the direct exchange uh, copper closed loop system. And so uh, that being said, one of the big advantages is the size of the, the loop itself is a very small uh, diameter loop. The, the size of the two lines going down are the size of your index fingers. And so because of that, we have a much smaller um, uh, loop uh, altogether. And, and in the design, again, from the factory, all of the, the overall flow and the oil return of the refrigerant to make sure we've got proper distribution and oil return is all designed and engineered in that design up front. So again, none of those things are concerns. Um, of uh, the designer and the installer. Um, naturally, having a more conductive material in the ground is a huge advantage. And uh, naturally, having copper being 850 times more conductive than the traditional uh, plastic loop gives a major advantage to a direct exchange loop besides its size itself. But that being said, it's about also delivering a lower upfront cost. So we're able to also deliver a a loop that has to be installed by doing less, installing less loop, but still delivering capacity. Again, it's about how well this heat exchanger is going to perform. And without capacity, we're going to we're, we're falling short in terms of energy savings. And so, if we can deliver the capacity, the rest will take care of itself. And that's where what we're going to find is that having a lower drilling cost because we ins we can install less because we have a more efficient heat exchange taking place in the ground is going to save us from not only up front but also in the long run. So again, on, on, a, on a DX system, having a 120 feet of, of loop per ton uh, and on an average is, is you know, going to save maybe four to 500 feet on a five ton project. Naturally, having a smaller borehole because the loop is also smaller is another advantage in terms of transferring that heat from uh, directly with the earth. And so having that smaller borehole also relates into a smaller piece of a drilling equipment, uh, smaller meaning also faster. And so speed and money and everything, it all continues to add up in, in the end. At the end, having a more efficient installation and a more efficient performing loop is really where we end up. Having a skinnier grout column, again, from a cost standpoint, less grout ne necessary. Um, and again, just allowing us to have a much more overall efficient, um, bare, uh, efficient uh, earth loop altogether. But the fact that we can, uh, we can, with a direct exchange system, that we have such a, an efficient exchange, uh, the loop itself is not only smaller, but it's much shallower. We, the most we have to do is 100 foot at maximum is the depth. And so by drilling at a much shallower depth, it gives us the ability to eliminate a lot of the challenges and, and the unnecessary and the unexpected costs when it comes to drilling. And so all of those things allow us to plan better and, and save in the long run. And so again, having that, those less challenges are huge. And when you combine all of that with the fact that our loop fluid is a refrigerant, which has a much better thermal heat transfer properties of moving heat than any other product out there, that's where the big advantage is. That's why refrigerant is used in every household product almost today. We're never going to get away from refrigerant um, because there's so many conveniences in our lives. Uh, every grocery store, every refrigerator, air conditioner, you name it, right? And so that's why it's used because its thermal properties are so amazing. And that's what we gain here. When you combine that conductive copper loop with 
refrigerant that's going to move 10 times more heat than a traditional a heat exchanger, a geothermal heat exchanger, we really are able to deliver the capacity that is really unexpected at these at really cold temperatures. And that allows us to have a, a loop that's really performing at its optimum year round. And when I say year round, even when the temperatures are in a very frozen and cold condition, the ground temperatures, we're able to deliver peak performance and high capacities where traditionally as that ground temperature drops, we're seeing the entering water temperature drop and we're seeing the capacity drop off. And that's when the efficiencies start to dive and that's when the run times start to go higher. And again, this is where we are able to do the exact opposite. We're able to maintain the efficiencies, satisfy the inside space, shut off the unit, allow the heat to recover around that loop much quicker, giving us a much better performing system. The next time it kicks on, it maintains itself at the same efficiency. So again, we're not driving that efficiency uh, down as we progress through the heating season. We're able to maintain it from the beginning to the end. And again, that's where that, that small heat exchange, that better heat exchange really, really shines. And especially when it comes to the homeowner savings. And we'll see that in a minute here. But uh, as, a, as a footprint, you can see uh, what we have here is this is one of the smaller designs that we have is is from a from a design standpoint this is where you can see a three foot the top uh, left picture is starting off with a three foot circle we're able to start with a three foot circle then a very small drill rig okay that eliminates a lot of major disruption every homeowner loves that nobody wants to tear up their whole yard if they don't have to and so by doing that then from there we can take off as you see in the top right picture we can take off of that three foot diameter borehole where all of the loops are contained and just run one trench back to the house again very very simple then then we tie the loops in as you see in the bottom left and then the center backfill it again look at how much disruption is made to the yard look at the space it took very small very compact very universal so it allows us the flexibility to put this in lots of places where you normally wouldn't be able to put it and, and even in the front yard in the side where, where, where their lots might be limited again a lot of flexibility and at the end of the day no one ever knew it was there so customers are willing to to do that uh, obviously because of the the less disruption to the yard and the key to it is at the end of the day um, it, it's all great but if we can't really deliver we can't perform then that's obviously it's not something that no anybody wants and so here you can see just a small example we've te we've we've done a case study on over 3,000 systems where they've been metered and and shown and proven what their true cost of operation is and at the end of the day the homeowner who spends that high spends that high dollar amount on this very efficient system that they're expecting to see a return on their investment when they see results like this they know that their money is being well spent. They know that they had a, re a return on their investment, like, and, and they're not afraid to share this technology with someone else and tell somebody, hey, you got to go geothermal. This is the answer. And so it's having those kind of results that delivers that satisfaction, that better satisfaction to the customer. The savings ultimately is what makes them happy, right? The comfort and at the same time, the overall better value, the simplicity of this makes it also a very big advantage. A n very simple system, not of a lot of electronics or controls to have to worry about pumps or anything like that in the future as well. So it did, again, it just gives it that overall better value. And, and again, building the be a better reputation and continuing that to be built for the geothermal industry. And so naturally, as we continue to try to hit these 20, 40 goals, that's really what our goal is. We're looking for drillers. We're looking for people to continue to scale this. And that's really what we're hoping to do is hit these, uh, hit these goals for 2040 for New York. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. Vous êtes prêt? Just kidding. Very glad to be here. Jean-Francois from Versa Profile. Basically, when I learned about the panel, I said, well, let's talk about innovation into ground loop uh, technology. So I just decided first to introduce our company, who we are. Versa Profile is a PE pipe manufacturer out in Quebec. 
So this is our mission statement. So right in there, you see that innovation, pipe, geothermal is all part of our, our, of our mission, or what we do at Versa Profile. So it's very important for us to do innovation. Actually, compared to the other solution that we have here, I guess everybody talks about the, the, the standard in the geothermal loose, which is HDPE pipe, which is what we do. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about. So we're located in Quebec, near, near Montreal, near Quebec City, actually. So two um, big plants that we produce those pipes, so it's not very really critical here. Uh, 15 extrusion line and a lot of people, a lot of uh, secondary process to do all of this. So we serve the geothermal, uh, gas, water, maple sap collecting tubing. So we are an extrusion company. This is what we do. In the geothermal industry, what we do, what the uh, uh, product we are known, known for is our Versa 5 vertical loop, which is the regular standard uh, single UVN loop. So we do them in different size, three quarter inch all the way up to two inch. You see, three, three quarter inch up to inch and a half, it's pretty common in the industry. Well, we go one step further, we do two inch. This is the type of innovation that we do. I'll talk about it a little bit later. We also do what we call the twin loop. What is a twin loop? It's basically two single loop combined together. So it's, you, you, you get better efficiency out of each borehole doing that. And the way they're made, you see it on a picture, you can actually do it on the job side. You can take each single loop and attach them together and boom, you got your, your twin loop. I'm gonna talk about this later also. So we do, of course, we do pipe, we do coil, we do everything that needs to be done in HDP uh, pipe, 47 pen uh, pipe. We are, this is, I think it's important to mention that we are part of the industry. We sit, we, our product are certified to the current standard, the CSA, NSF, whatever standard for the geothermal industry. And we sit on the, on the standard com committee. It's important to mention because if we want this market to grow, the product needs to be easily certified, easily known. So the engineer that does the project knows, they just say, well, product needs to meet this and that certification and the, the manufacturer needs to be able to prove it. So we have a track record in innovation for PE pipe or extrusion loop. Some of us, that, some of you that were here many years ago, we, you know we've been promoting what we call a geo performance, which was the thermally enhanced HDPE pipe dedicated for the geothermal market. That would improve the heat transfer between the ground and the, the, the liquid in the, in, the, in the loops. It was pretty effective. It was, it, it allows about 10 to 25 length reduction of bore field. So it, it worked. It was a little bit more expensive. A few projects, a couple of projects were actually made uh, doing that. But we, d we decided as a company to abandon, to let go this technology because of what? because it was actually impossible to certify to um, <coughs> current standard, as mentioned before. I mean, engineer out there, they want to see a product that is certified. We couldn't, we couldn't get this thing certified because, well, it is not PE 4710. It's, it's a mixture, it's a formulation, different. So people knew it worked, but it wasn't certified, so we could not justify it, and an engineer on big project could not use it. Cost was a little bit higher than the other, but then again, if you did the whole calculation, it was still worth it. Because of this, at low market acceptance, so we decided, well, let's forget about this and do something else. But then the twin loop, we talked about it before, I just mentioned it. It's two regular loop attached, combined together, made on the manufacturing process, and then ship on the job site. So again, it's an evolution of the regular uh, <coughs> geothermal loops. It's not something very different, it's just something slightly better, slightly more, more, more effective. So it's, and, and the thing is, twin loop or double U-band, double loop, it's something that's done in Europe all the time. Everywhere they use it, they, they, it's something that is proven to, to extract about 20, 25% more heat of each borrow. So, so a lot of the literature that we have done, we, ha we have had university teachers, professors, uh, researchers, the, the doctorate, PhDs actually, do analysis of the different configuration of single loop, double loop, uh, uh, 
uh, an ant, not an ant, and so on. So the most efficient configuration out there is inch and a half, DR11, double loop. This is what gives the best result in, in theory and practical also uh, proven record, records. It is a little bit more difficult to install, but again, with time, uh, drillers uh, do, do the, uh, the good thing and, and learn how to install it, and it proves to be very, very efficient. Mentioned before, we now have a two-inch loop. It's something that we decided, well, as, as soon as the job are getting uh, deeper, need bigger project, less land space, we think a bigger loop would be, will be an option. Again, there's some challenge for installation, but at least it's, it's available, you can do it. So basically, I, I came here to, to be on the panel to answer the question, there's got to be something better. Does it really need to have something better? I mean, what we need to focus as an industry, you need the, we need the industry to grow, to grow. We need to have easy market acceptance for the, for the product. We need something that is <laughs> known by everyone, accepted by anyone, and easy to transfer from one company to the others, from one drilling to the other. So we need something that is common to the whole industry. If everybody does his own thing, I don't think it's, it's a good thing for the industry. We need, I personally think, that we need an evolution, not a revolution in Guadalupe. We need standardization. We need all the loops that, well, different lengths maybe, but a, a few different lengths, but something more, more similar from, from one manufacturer to the others. So I think HGP loops with a few adjustments like we've made are the best evolution for the technology. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna go into some questions. Yeah, first though, uh, my colleague Scott Smith would like to make a, uh, a short announcement. Here, I'll start. Uh, I gotta put something in English. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm actually gonna take the, I guess this is the platinum sponsor um, <coughs> uh, benefit for me. Um, uh, so it's do something a little weird. It's actually going to be like a PSA, almost more for the panelists than all of you. But many of you, I think, would be interested in this too. Um, but I got to start by just saying, um, Rob is not my favorite just because we're wearing the same shirt. That was a total coincidence. <clears throat> um, but you know, he's he's thinking about moving his company to New York. And so, if you're in the geo business and you want to move your company to New York, we will be thrilled. Um, well, we have a program, and I actually want to recognize my colleague, Michael Genovese. Mike, would you mind standing up just really quick? So Mike's in our innovation group at, at NYSERDA, and we have a program called NextGen. It used to be NextGen HVAC, now it's just NextGen. We're going to be releasing it again in the next month or two. Um, and there might be, so it's a series of challenges that we put out to the market to innovate. And there might be um, a, a challenge in this version of the solicitation that many of you will be interested in. Um, we can't talk about what the solicitation is going to be yet because it's not out. Um, but what I can talk about is something, is something that we've done in the past. And a few years ago, we did a cost compression challenge for innovative geothermal loops. Um, and we got some good projects. We did a project, I think, with Killfrost. Maybe we had one with Dandelion. Um, and so um, we, we are definitely interested and have been in the past in, in reducing the cost of, of ground source heat pumps. Um, it's a, you know, we, we realize there are competing forces there, um, but, but if we can you know, do some work to innovate and do the next generation of ground source heat pumps in New York, we'll be thrilled. Um, so the PON number is 3519, next gen, um, and look for it to come out on the street. If you want an email from one of us or have any questions about it, see Mike or I, or even Andrew after the yeah. session. Next gen, buildings. next gen Buildings is the title this year. Thank you. All right, so now to some Q&A. Thank you. Tell me where to go. We have uh, this gentleman right here in the front. Thank you for calling me a gentleman. That's uh, appreciated. <laughs> okay. Uh, so to the panelists, when we do in-situ thermal conductivity testing to the ASHRAE ICSPA CSA standards, we're talking 15, 25 watts per foot. What would you guys propose for your systems that have lower borehole resistance? 
Well, I mean, I'll start, I guess. Hello? Yeah, it's a, okay. Uh, in my experience, you know, I, 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 ask, I don't ask uh, the connectivity test to be changed because when we do a side-by-side -side comparison, the difference is obvious. In other words, there's a 48-hour test, and you see a, a logarithmic curve that you, I know you know everything, but maybe everybody else here doesn't know. But over 48 hours, you'll see that temperature response. And, and um, when you do a side-by-side -side comparison of those two, there will be, compared to a standard inch and a quarter U-bend, if we're, if we're uh, adding 80 BTUs per foot, 80, 80 BTU per hour per foot, the difference in temperature response is about 9 to 10 degrees right, uh, uh, between my product and a standard product. So from my perspective, uh, you, the data is usable still, and the, ob the difference is obvious to any engineer who's, uh, who's you know, familiar with this process. So I don't suggest any changes, but it is possible that you would want to increase the heat rate some amount to further you know, enhance the, uh, the resolution of what you're looking at. But it tells the story in the process that we're currently Right. Yeah. So that's my perspective. I don't know if anybody else has a perspective on this. No comment. <laughs> no, it's kidding. <laughs> I, I'm not an expert uh, with Rigan product in that perspective. I, I do know, like for these deeper wells, they have to you have more heating elements. I believe that they're still going with that. You know, that range about you know uh, 80 BTU per foot or 80 watts per per foot. So. I don't think that they're modifying that test. Yeah, I did the original testing for Spiralex, the precursor to what we've done, and we did a massive test at the end of the way down on the test that was yeah. At the end of the day, like you said, I think the capacity is really what matters here. At the end of the day, that's really what matters. And so doing that, that's something that is, doesn't just occur in a very short window. And, and as we know, that capacity can increase or it can decrease depending upon those conditions. Those conditions are varying throughout the whole season. And so, and I sort of done a good job doing those long year long studies to see the overall, but I think that's really at the end, at the end of the day where we, where we achieve what the end all goal is for us to say, okay, how do we deliver and reduce the most uh, you know, reduce the demand on electricity, but deliver the most uh, powerful impact to our, to our, you know, to our clients. And so I think that's really the overall picture. Great. Any, any other questions? Oh, all the way in the back. Hi, Elizabeth McCorby. I was talking earlier the first day, um, and one gentleman that sells parts was talking about how it would be really innovative if someone um, did solar and kind of attached it to the geothermal to, I guess, get the heat and the electricity. So can does anybody know of anything like that up on the panel? that currently exist that can tie the two together? I learned a little something this morning. Um, it, there, there are some, uh, some guys that are from Scandinavia that are uh, demonstrating a geothermus. And what they're doing is they're, I want to say overheating the ground but they're using a CO2 heat pump along with solar. So they're utilizing the solar energy to power the CO2 heat pumps, which are really good at giving you a high lift, you know, take, taking water from a low temperature to a high temperature really efficiently. And they're putting that in the ground. And then they're building it up in the ground and they're drawing off of that throughout the winter. And they have a case study of a school where they have this set up, it's about 100,000 square foot school. And the performance of this system is given really high percent coefficient of performance 
And what, and what they've demonstrated is they start this system operating, entering water temperatures that are really high, and even by the end of the winter, temperatures are just much higher than what you naturally get from the ground. So in that way, they're taking solar energy, that's electricity, using heat pump, putting that in the ground, and then providing you a super efficient geothermal system. So I, I, maybe that's you know, similar to what you're asking, I think. Steve? Yeah, like Dave said, at the end of the day, they're, you're taking the, your, the solar energy that's generated from the solar panels and using that to power the geothermal system. And the biggest savings we're going to find is when you take a geothermal system and you do more than just heat and cool the house, but if you can heat the hot water at the same time and those solar panels are able to achieve all three things, you're going to see the biggest demand being reduced that's taken, you know, taken, that's putting a stress on the grid. And by combining all three of those, doing 100% heating, cooling, and hot water with the geothermal combined with the solar panel, that's where you really see the, the full savings of potential of combining those technologies together as opposed to just heating or just cooling. Yeah. What I can add to that is th there are some projects where actually engineers do combine the solar and geothermal energy. So it's a case-by-case -case, uh, situation where it, it does happen. So yeah, it's a feasibility. Uh, Steve Hamster, the Gray Edge Group, and I'll just comment that there's a U.S. manufacturer called Sundrum Solar. Uh, we've worked with them and the University of Dayton, Dr. Andrew Chiasson. Uh, they have a product that's been available for a number of years. They have several case studies on their website combining a solar PVT hybrid solution, so PV plus thermal plus heat pump, and they have it pretty well documented. Uh, it's manufactured right up here in New England. Uh, so, and we've included it on several of the projects we've been working on with NYSERDA here in New York. So there are solutions here. There are several good solutions out of Europe as well, in Spain. Uh, but the, the, the neat part about the Sundrum product is that it's an uninsulated hydronic panel behind the PV, which means we can use it for heat rejection as well. So we worked on a very large project in Houston where we could actually pre-cool a bore field overnight because of the high diurnal temperature swings from day to night in like a desert circumstance. Uh, so, so there are options out there. Thank you. I think right behind Steve. Hi, my name is uh, Kim and I'm one of the Scandinavians. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we were a small part of the Thermos project that you talked about in Norway, and uh, we actually have uh, our Norwegian CEO in our booth in the, in the start of the hallway, if you want to know more about that project. But uh, th it has been some projects uh, over here as well. Drake Landing is one of them that also had a similar concept, uh, and it worked really well. The, I would say that the biggest benefit is that you use all of the solar um, energy during the summer when the electricity price is normally st as lowest, and then you could reuse that heat during the winter when the electricity price are highest. So it's, uh, it's worked really well. I, th I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. I have a question for Bill. Um, with a direct exchange system, how do you handle refrigerant changes, especially now with the uh, low flammable refrigerants on the horizon? Yeah, thank you. Um, the, uh, the refrigerant change is no different. This is nothing new to our company as we've been through the refrigerant tra uh, transitions from R12 to 22 and 22 to 410A and now 410A to the next refrigerant. And uh, so it's, it's not uncommon or uncharted territory by any means, but at the end of the day, a refrigerant's a refrigerant and the, the whole chemical, the design it, is why are we choosing the refrigerants we're using to this day? It's because of 
high thermal heat transfer properties, but every refrigerant, regardless of whatever we're using, it has a very low boiling point. So regardless of whatever that chemical makeup is, whenever it enters atmosphere, whether that's frozen 32 or zero degrees or 55 degree ground or water, it's immediately vaporizing. And that is why to this day, it is in every single one of your homes in your household refrigerators. And even though you have a leak and you eat that food, nobody gets harmed. So at the end of the day, they all, it's all based around the, the chemical engineering and the design of what is being used in that mixture so that it has that low boiling point so that it also has the ability to extract and reject heat in large amounts. So very safe regardless. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you everybody for coming.